I'm recording this one out of order because I just really want to do this and um, the future of space is going to require a little bit more research to keep that updated. This is an evergreen one. Let's talk about conspiracy theories. So this class is called Science, Technology, and Society. And a couple of years ago, I realized that I was doing my students a disservice by not talking about all of the nonsense that they hear um, on Facebook or TikTok or from their friends and let's be honest, your family um, about all of the various conspiracy theories and uh, pseudoscience and all of these various things. So we're gonna talk about some of them and, and some of the things that we talk about you might believe. And I hope that you'll listen because I, you know, I don't know all of the answers to everything, <clears throat> but I think I have some tools for how to uh, approach the world and especially the world that is filled with perilous information, uh, the way the internet is. So hopefully some of this might prove to be useful to you all. So, um, we're going to talk about the flat earth. <laughs> um, so what do people that believe in the flat earth believe? They believe a couple of uh, different things that are all interrelated. First, the flat earth society believes that the earth is disc shaped. That in fact the Earth um, the, has a the North Pole is at the center, and there is no such thing as the South Pole. It's just a giant ice wall around the edge of the Earth. And come to think of it, you don't know anyone that's been to the South Pole, so who are you to say? That means that um, there's just a lot more land, or I guess space, I guess a uh, ocean in the outer uh, edge of this disk. Secondly, they believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. Uh, objects fall toward it. Um, objects, there is still gravity. So gravity is just a, a pushing force down instead of a attraction between objects in the universe. And every other planet every other star, the sun and the moon, those are all spherical and glo globular, but the earth is not. And they all orbit us in some sense. They're not quite going around us, but they are, uh, imagine like tracing a path um, the way this shows. They're all, it's like a flashlight um, pointing at various aspects of a pizza. And lastly, everything that we've talked about up until now is a hoax. <laughs> There's no, there was no moon landing. There was nothing. There was none of this is true. So, we've known that the Earth isn't flat for millennia. Uh, there is in, in Homer. Um, there are uh, there's evidence that uh, he represented the thought of the Earth is flat. But since the Egyptians, uh, we've accepted the, that the Earth is spherical. Pythagoras, uh, who was a cult leader who loved beans for some reason and was vegetarian, and literally his cult executed a person for proving that there were irrational numbers, um, threw him off of a ship. He thought that a uh, the sphere was the perfect form, therefore the Earth is, should be the sphere at the center of the universe. Aristotle argued that it was deducible that the Earth is a sphere from simple observations. The fact that you never see like a wedge or a, a cylindrical sh shaped shadow on the moon, it's always spherical. Um, you can make certain observations, he thought. Ptolemy also agrees with these observations. He, he points out that as you go up and uh, south and, and north, uh, you get to see different stars. Uh, 
And in fact, they, you can start modeling it as a sphere of everything surrounding us. And the only way that it actually, like, it's actually really, really awesome uh, stuff. When you read Ptolemy's writings, there's some genius reasoning there. And it's side by side with some crazy conclusions and some reason, like, tr very true conclusions. We knew roughly how big the planet was. We knew lots of things about it. And Ptolemy using very, the same reasoning comes to conclusions that are way ahead of his time and really, really wrong. And they're all like interspersed with each other. So it's kind of fun to read. Uh, uh, Tycho Brahe had a different model where the earth wasn't quite the center of the universe. Um, I mean, it was, but everything else orbited the sun. So that was kind of a weird model. He could never get the math to work out, which is why he hired Johannes Kepler, but Kepler ended up not agreeing with him. He, he hired Kepler as a mathematician and Kepler, uh, he, he assigned him to calculate the orbit of Mars, which is particularly thorny. Kepler plugged away at it for long enough to realize that Brahe's model was completely wrong. Um, but then, all right. So those were people that believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and spherical, right? So um, different from Homer, different from the flat Earth view. Yeah. At around the same time as uh, Aristotle, Aristarchus of Samos argues that the Earth must be a sphere of some sort. And it, it must be orbiting the sun. And he, can, he calculates this, um, inferring roughly the size of the sun. And he thinks, well, it's weird that the sun, which is way, way bigger than us, should orbit us. Uh, and then he uses kind of slipshod reasoning, but comes to the, the right conclusion as opposed to Ptolemy. Copernicus in 1543 publishes the De Revolutionis, which is the thing that we now in Western society um, attribute the very first heliocentric models to. Um, and he argues that the Earth cannot be the center of the sun, or at least his models do. He made sure to have this published after he died so that he couldn't get um, tortured the way. Other people were tortured and, and burned alive at the time. Johannes Kepler, uh, who really, really worshipped math in a way that's re honestly reminiscent of Pythagoras, found himself sort of frustrated that the math and the observations forced him to um, conclude that the Earth had a spherical, or sorry, had a an elliptical orbit around the sun rather than um, a completely spherical. He thought that it would be a circular orbit would be the right uh, orbit, but the, the observations didn't match it, and, and he came up with several laws of a planetary motion that helped explain the observations in a way nobody had ever seen before. Newton systematized these and uh, proposed that these laws were universal, which uh, is the scientific revolution, right? Like this is the scientific revolution that leads us to thinking about the world completely differently. For more on that, take my Quark Humanities 212 class, Science, Technology, and Society in the Modern Era. So, okay, we've known that the Earth is spherical for a long, long time, and people had been arguing that it was not the center of the universe since at least uh, the third century BCE. Um, in the early, uh, well, a couple of thousand years ago, Aristophanes um, conducted an experiment in which he was tr uh, able to try to conclude, or he was able to conclude the size of the planet based on some very, very basic trigonometry. You could actually do this if you thought about it, but you didn't. <laughs> so he, um, he made certain observations uh, based on a column and a well and he calculated uh, the exact height and the exact distance. And then he calculated roughly the 
the, the distance uh, between them on a sphere. And he calculated the Earth's size pretty accurately. So we've known not just that it was spherical, but we've known basically the exact size of the planet for thousands of years. Right? That's the science um, of, of a spherical Earth. What about the Earth not being the center of the universe? So that one's actually more recent, right? We knew that it was spherical for thousands of years, but we've only known that it, it wasn't the center of the universe. And I mean, really, really known since roughly about 16 and change, 1609, 1630, depending on where you, what uh, publications you want to date and who you want to take as the standard bearer of the time. Ptolemy had a model, and the model had the Earth be the center. But it wasn't quite the center. The only way that the uh, circular orbits of the planets and the stars made sense was if they orbited something slightly off center, like a, a little bit away from the center of Earth. All right, OK, that's fine. It talks, but you know, what can you do? God. Uh, must have planned something, <laughs> uh, must have meant that in a certain way. And then actually that wasn't enough. He had to um, also add something called an equant, which was an, an entirely different spot in space where the area traced out by the orbiting stars, this is roughly the center circle on the, the screen, the area traced out by A and B uh, was traced out in the, the same amount of time by the planets. So there's a different circle center of the universe than the Earth. And furthermore, the thing that explains the speed and position of the planets is an entirely different center. And then you still can't quite explain how uh, certain objects move. The word planet literally means wandering star. We thought that there were seven planets, including the sun and the moon at the time. But uh, Ptolemy, with his very, very accurate observations, notices that the, the planets seem to be going back, um, back in space a little bit relative to the other stars that are all moving in the same direction at the same time. So we call this retrograde, right? Sometimes you see, like in astrology, Mercury is in retrograde, so don't start any new projects today. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I made that place. Kermit the Frog is really into astrology, I guess. Um, so, okay, planets go into in retrograde motion. That is, they go back and forth in the sky. So the way Ptolemy made that make sense was all right, the stars orbit a different spot, that's the eccentric, they orbit at different speeds, that's the equant. Um, and also the planets have an entirely different sphere that they're obeying where they, they have second orbits, what are called epicycles. Um, so they orbit within their orbits. And that really, really, really makes sense of all of the observations that we see. Fast forward to Copernicus publishing his model. Tycho Brahe didn't like, or Tycho Brahe didn't like that. He's the last uh, uh, famous astronomer to not use telescopes. He did use very, very precise and giant instruments though. And so he comes up with another model. Can't quite make the math make sense, make the observations make sense. So his model eventually is discarded, but it is a model. Okay, Ptolemy. Three very, very distinct, um, very troubling adjustments to make the, the math fit the observations. But that was the dominant view for thousands of years. So when you look at the Ptolemaic, uh, it, well, when you look at a heliocentric model on the left um, and a Ptolemaic model, you can see on the right, you can kind of see that the orbits are get really funky. There's some like little loop-de-loops. Um, and so trying to make that make sense within their own spheres was its own uh, issue. At the time, 
they, people thought that they each orbited within a sphere, so they didn't run into each other. We call that roughly distance. All right, Copernicus publishes his geocentric or heliocentric model, and what do we see? Well, it, it's it turns out that it was uh, way simpler than Ptolemy's model in some sense, but way less precise. He couldn't predict where the stars or the planets were with anywhere near the accuracy Ptolemy could. Uh, Ptolemy's model was uh, kept being adjusted for a long time to um, to avoid certain objections. So we would say it was not falsifiable, but it was conservative. It was a view that everybody had accepted, whereas Copernicus's um, hypothesis was way out of the mainstream. It turned out to be more fruitful though. Um, and it led to lots of new science. Both were consistent and Copernicus, I don't think he was particularly uh, enamored of his model. He, he just thought that the math made it make more sense. Um, observations were wrong, though, and they didn't get to be right until Johannes Kepler, um, about a century later, made some modifications. So in order to get the Copernican model to be in any way comparable to the utility of the Ptolemaic model, which by the way, you could still use to, to sail. Uh, Kepler had to introduce elliptical orbits where the sun wasn't the center, but it was one of the foci. He had to copy some of Ptolemaic, uh, Ptolemy's equant. So the, the planets trace the same sort of orbit around the sun. And uh, furthermore, he, he had to um, calculate their uh, distance, their, um, their orbit to at a different uh, rate. So, so think about when we're comparing these. In Ptolemy's model, we've made three um, idealizing assumptions, but we've justified everything that has said that has been said about the Earth being the center of the universe in the Bible and in history, right? It's very, very conservative. Three big mathematical, um, three ginormous mathematical assumptions. In comes Copernicus, and he introduces the earth as moving. Nobody ever feels like the wind is blowing in their hair, but the earth is moving. That's one assumption. It's rotating on its own axis. That's two. That's two movements that nobody can account for in their daily experience that are not what is said in all of the history books. So it's moving, it's rotating, and then and then, and then, and then, we have to start adjusting um, the orbits. So Ptolemy's, Kepler's isn't much simpler. It's about as precise. It's a little more falsifiable. It's way less conservative. So we can compare these various hypotheses and think, oh man, well, okay. I can see why Kepler won out, but you can also see why people at the time were not really willing to give up on something that was tried and true for a thing that had as many um, idiosyncratic and counterintuitive assumptions as the Ptolemaic system did. People were used to the Ptolemaic system idiosyncrasies. Nobody was used to, to the new systems of heliocentrism. So that's just a, a bit of a historical overview to help you understand how people, how scientists at the time and since um, adjusted their view. You know, Matt, uh, Max Planck said um, something called Max or Planck's principle: science advances one funeral at a time. So. Um, anyway. So Ptolemy 
is eventually rejected by new astronomers who find that they can do a lot more work with the Copernican and Keplerian system. Fast forward a couple of hundred years and we start seeing a resurgence of a flat Earth belief, not just a geocentric Earth belief, but a flat Earth belief, something that we had abandoned like more than 2,000 years ago. There are some arguments for it. Let's go over those, uh, those arguments. First, if gravity pulls you down and you're standing at one of the poles, surely the person at the, uh, the South Pole would fall off the face of the Earth. All right, so some understanding of how uh, gravity works, but thinking that it pushes things down instead of objects toward other objects. So a disagreement on really some observations that we've seen for, for hundreds of years. And then this, uh, this simple common sense intuition that if the world were spinning, wouldn't people fly off into outer space? Wouldn't people be crushed, buildings be crushed under centrifugal forces? This was an objection Galileo faced. And his response to it was, well, when you're on an airplane, after you take off, you just feel like you're sitting still. You don't constantly continue to feel the g-forces. That required a different understanding of motion than what the ancients thought. They thought something called impetus theory of motion as opposed to inertia theory of motion. But, all right, so these arguments, they, they seem to betray a non-current scientific understanding. But let's try to take them seriously. Let's keep going. Um, universal gravitation, uh, according to Newton, was that uh, this property between objects. It's not that objects fall down. It's that they fall toward the biggest mass that's nearby. And it ha so happens that we are on a giant 8,000 mile across hunk of, of, of rock. So it's down to us because it is the biggest object closest to us. Creatures don't fall off the other face of the earth. Uh, also, we've seen that the earth isn't flat. But OK, all right, that's not. <laughs> you can actually uh, go to YouTube and, and do the ISS live stream. Um, check that out sometime. It's kind of fun. All right, so we're going to have to, if we're going to in any way defend flat Earth, we are going to have to talk about the moon hoax. Um, because it's not just Newton's arguments that you have to contend with. It's direct observation. People dropped hammers on the moon. So um, here's some of the evidence that is usually marshaled by uh, people that um, advocate for the moon landing being a hoax. First, the Martian reg or the lunar regolith doesn't move, which seems to be inconsistent with a big force knocking the dust loose. In some shots, um, it appears that the flag is the US flag is flapping in some of the videos. There's no stars in the sky. There's photographs everywhere, but nobody can point to any cameras. There seems to be multiple light sources. And then just like the convenience, um, John F. Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. And we went there in this decade. <laughs> um, OK, let's take these in turn. Um, the lunar regolith, uh, it turns out, um, is actually not as it does not operate the way uh, the way anything on Earth does. Um, there's not enough wind uh, for one thing to push things away to to carry all of that. Um, plus, it's magnetized. It's actually a lot of silica, so it just behaves differently than you expect from being on Earth. Um, it's weird that Neil Armstrong made such a big deal about the soil or about the regolith when he was there. 
but you can see why people would be convinced or would be troubled by this. The second one doesn't make much sense to me. The uh, US flag flaps, well, because everything flaps if you move it, it was moved and there's less gravity, less things to, to stop it. Where are the stars? Jesus, man, has nobody ever taken a picture? You need to expose it properly to see stars, even on Earth. I mean, come on, that, one, that one's actually dumb. Where are the cameras? You actually can see pictures of the cameras. There were cameras on every spacesuit, um, facing everything. They were filming everything. Um, why are there uh, shadows from multiple light sources? Well, because there are multiple light sources. Um, and then, uh, isn't it convenient? Yeah, maybe. I don't know, some things are convenient. Uh, JFK dying didn't seem that convenient to him, but yeah, okay, sure. Not a great argument though, argument against convenience. So what do we do with this? How do we talk about this? How do we deal with this? Um, I think, uh, one thing that we should probably um, talk about is how to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. And I think that um, something that Karl Popper, one of the readings from earlier in the semester said, uh, might be helpful here, but it might not be. Let's, um, his view was that science can be falsified, whereas pseudoscience cannot. I think, um, if you try to take that too far, you find really it really difficult to uh, keep this ongoing, keep this as a, a a viable definition of science, because there's entire branches of science that cannot be falsified now or possibly ever. And then you can actually imagine coming up with experiments to test the moon hoax or the flat earth theory. Um, in fact, if you watch some documentaries or if you see some of these interviews with flat earth, flat earthers, they constantly are um, or structuring tests, experiments. Uh, often they go against their own uh, views and then they dismiss them. So maybe they don't have the scientific intuition. Um, I think um, my favorite approach is by a philosopher named Irm Lakatos, who actually distinguishes not between falsifying and not falsifying, but between what's known as a progressive and a degenerative research program. And the idea of a progressive research program is that you can continue to do more research and get more results from it. On the other hand, a degenerating research program is one where you spend most of the time trying to justify why you continue to believe what you believe. Conspiracy theories have a degenerative flavor to them. Everything, they, they are self-sealing in the sense that um, they spend more time trying to explain themselves than other things. They can unify and explain all evidence, but it's at the expense of fruitfulness and, and falsifiability. Um, I, think, I think that's a helpful like philosophical viewpoint. I don't know how far it takes you um, because I think that we are all victim in some sense to degenerating research programs and if you don't have anything to replace them with, it's really hard to know what to do. Uh, so, so what are some tips? How, how can we avoid uh, making mistakes of believing um, things that are, well, in the flat earth theory, pretty laughable, pretty ridiculous? But you can walk yourself down that path because it explains everything. I mean, that's one of the problems. It's so good. It, humans are so good at explanations that once we accept viewpoints that are extremely counterintuitive, we can actually still explain everything we want to with them. We just can't really talk to, to our friends and, and family at Thanksgiving anymore. <laughs> um, 
So one thing that might be helpful to pay attention to aside from, from philosophy is some social factors. Everybody, uh, there is, there is a, a messenger to every message. So think about who is sending messages and why. In the case of academic scientists, we don't get paid very much. There's not enough grant money to, to justify us lying. Like I, I feel like a lot of people that think that um, scientists are, are making up climate change or whatever to, to just get grant money truly don't understand how little we fund science in this country or in most countries really. Um, and how that's not actually the, the goal of a lot of science. It'd be super, you could get super famous in science for disproving uh, controversial or, or well-accepted views. Mass media, um, they, there are values there, right? So it's not a publishing as a value. It's not, um, it's not self-aggrandizement in, in every case. But there are timeliness, conflict, prestige, proximity, impact, and bizarreness, right? That's the reason uh, we pay attention to things that, that draw us from um, important celebrities or presidents or whatnot. Like what, people, what politicians say is news, even if it wouldn't be news if your neighbor said it. Recent stuff is news, even though it wouldn't be news if it happened five years ago. Social media, that might just be me but even biased against social media, but, but social media is a hellhole. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see there, you should probably check against other sorts of biases and other sorts of tips. The point is not to avoid bias, but to actually be aware and realize that we all come with a perspective. Um, corporate entities biased towards their own mission and financial interests. So when we're talking about the moon, uh, landing, and we're talking about the flat earth. I think, I mean, who the hell knows? Like, it could be a giant conspiracy. Everywhere in, in the universe, everyone in the planet got together and coordinated across all of these biases and values to fool people for some purpose um, or another. And when the Soviet Union said that they were, uh, you know, when they were competing against the United States, they were willing to take a dive on exposing the United States for faking the moon landing because you know they would have wanted to, but they were willing to, to keep up the lie just to, for some reason. It just doesn't pass the smell test. And, and I think um, trying to keep in mind the various stakeholders and the various sources and the, the various um, kinds of information that we get, I think can be very helpful, um, especially when we're faced with other kinds of pseudoscience and other kinds of conspiracy theories moving forward. Um, one thing that you should be aware of, it's easy to spot it in other people, but we are all a victim in the exact same way. We all want to believe the things that are consistent with what we already believe. Um, so motivated reasoning, confirmation bias affect us all. Um, and you should try to be wary, right? So if, if you see a YouTube video from someone who's trying to convince you of a thing, they are motivated because they, they think they figured out some deep secret and they really, really want to like share it. But they're not necessarily motivated by uh, things that you should value. Um, I tend to think that most secret, like conspiracy theories, ha conspiracies happen, but most of the time, anything that requires too many people to keep secrets just seem implausible on their face to me. Um, any exclusive or emotional evidence or resistance to evidence, I think, is also something to be cautious of and wary of. So we'll keep these in mind as we move forward throughout the semester and talk about other pseudoscience and other conspiracy um, theories. And hopefully this will be a nice fun wrap up of the space section. Uh, thank you.